All right, hello everybody. This is Husky Hacks, and welcome to the demo portion of my talk, Husky vs. WannaCry, a crash course in malware reverse engineering. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about environmental setup just so that you have the right tools, uh, the right methodology, and a safe environment to dissect and analyze malware in. We're going to talk about uh, where to source these binaries if you want to follow along at home. And then we're going to go into each of the areas of analysis. We're going to start with static analysis and look at some of the static artifacts. We're going to do some basic dynamic analysis, do some registry, examine the registry artifacts, and look at uh, core functions in the debugger. And then we're going to finish up by loading it into Ghidra and tearing it apart and looking at different uh, functions and seeing if we can find some of the decompiled code. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm glad that you're with me, and let's jump right in. So on the left-hand side, we're going to have Flare VM. Flare VM is a fantastic Windows-based malware uh, analysis platform. It's got tons and tons of tools. We can't possibly cover them all in, in this video, but it's got ev basically everything you need to do uh, analysis. And we're going to be able to run the binary uh, in real time and see its functions uh, on Flare VM. And then the other one is Remnux. Remnux is a Linux distribution tool. And you might be wondering why would you want to analyze a Windows binary on a Linux platform? If you don't want the additional risk of keeping a binary uh, on the environment and maybe running it when you didn't intend to, you can do any amount of static analysis uh, off the platform that the binary was written for. In other words, you can use a Linux uh, distribution. You're not going to be able to run it on the Linux distribution natively. There are some tools that you can actually do that, but we're not going to cover those. Uh, but you can do any kind of static analysis that you want. So you can look at binary strings. Uh, you can even load it into Ghidra uh, on this uh, Linux box. So those are the two distribution platforms that we're going to be using to do this analysis. So I have them uh, right here in my own uh, instance of VM workstation. And so they're up and running. And the first thing that we're going to want to do before we really do anything else, is just absolutely 100% make sure that these are not on your, <laughs> certainly not on your home network. You don't you don't want these natted. You don't want them bridged. Uh, you're gonna want them to be on their own dedicated separate uh, subnet. You're gonna go up to the uh, virtual network editor, and this is basically going to be all of the networks that are assigned to your uh, VM. Uh, instance, right? And you can actually customize these. You see that I have one that's uh, the natted um, IP address. So if I wanted to keep my hosts on a natted subnet, they will end up on the 10, 10, 1, 0 network. My actual like home router network is 10, 0, 0, I think, um, slash 24. But down here, I have VMNet 14, which is custom. And this is actually set if you go down here to change the settings, load up the network configurations. Um, VM 14 is host only. And essentially, host only means that uh, you're only physically connected to the host, but you have no network connectivity out of that. If you're set to this and you have unchecked and connect a host virtual adapter to this network, you are good to go. You're safe and any kind of malware that you run that has any kind of network traffic connectivity, maybe it jumps to another box once it's de uh, detonated. Um, if you have set this to host only and you've unchecked this, you are good to go. And the way that you can check that, and this this has already been, I've already uh, configured this, you can go to the settings of any of your uh, virtual machines and make sure that you're set to this, VMNet 14. Again, that's the, my host only one that's going to be uh, separate from the rest of my uh, network. And the other things that you want to do with this are just the easy things. Try to go out to google.com. Okay, nothing good, but that could just be a DNS issue, right? So then go to ping. 8.8.8.8. .8 yep, ping transmit fail. Okay, so we can't get out to Google, so that's good. And then the other thing that you want to do is check. So let's ping 10.0.0.1, which would be my home uh, router, right? And if it could hit this, I mean, you're still in danger if uh, the malware has any kind of, um, you know, transmission capability. Uh, so if you've done this and you don't get any responses, you're probably good to continue on with the actual analysis, knowing that you're going to be safe from any kind of network impact. All right, so you have set up your environment. You've got Flare VM and Remnux up and running. You've set up a separate VLAN subnet that's not going to be able to touch anything on your home network or even get out to the internet. Great, fantastic. So you're ready to go. Uh, where do you actually get this stuff? Surprisingly, it's actually pretty easy. 
Um, <laughs> I was a little surprised on how easy it was to find live repositories of malware just out on the internet. In fact, you can just find it on GitHub. And this is by uh, Yitz If. Yit, Y-T-I-S-F. Not sure how to pronounce that. But this is the zoo. This is a live malware repository. And you can literally go to any of these malwares. You got the source code, but also just the binaries. And man, any... Oh boy, any major kind of malware that's been caught in the wild, you're going to be able to find right here. And um, if you're following along at home, I mean, your ransomware WannaCry sample is probably right there. You could try either one of these. Um, so this is just a full repository of any kind of malware that you would want to do any analysis on. Um, this is this is all live. So, you know, this is kind of the disclaimer here. If you're going to do this, re remember that you're dealing with live malware samples. None of these have been kind of... Uh, neutered or uh, the functionality has been taken out. Nope, these are the literal live binary samples. Uh, if you detonate these on your host computer, bad things will happen, I promise you. All right, so first up, basic static analysis. Basic in that we'll take a limited approach to the tools and methodologies that we'll be using, uh, just grabbing kind of the lowest hanging fruit about looking at the binary and static because we are not going to be running the binary while we're doing this. Uh, so if it's a static analysis, it can be done either in Flare VM or Remnux. I'm going to just keep it in Flare VM just so that we have it up right here. And so the first thing that you're going to want to do, let's say you grab a new malware sample and uh, you want to see if anybody else has found this sample uh, in the wild before and submitted it maybe for as a piece of malware. Um, a really good way to do that is to grab the MD5 sum hash of the uh binary in question and submit that to a like a virus database like virus total and so what we're going to do is md5 sum.exe wanna cry and there's our md5 sum pretty easy and we're going to go to a fantastic site called virus total.com virus total of course this is outside this is like on my physical host because i don't have any internet connectivity to my uh my flare vm instance right now so all my physical hosts submit this sum to virus total look at that that's uh, i mean i'm not surprised of course uh the wannacry super famous uh you know malware I, I would be actually it says it says 61 out of 67 so i'm even wondering about what the ones that don't say that it's yeah so okay great uh word to the wise ignore any of these as your endpoint <laughs> defense mechanisms all of these major virus engines are going to say that this is uh you know a virus okay great fantastic Great, MD5 sum, that's our first part of static analysis taken care of, fantastic. So we're gonna start with one of the more simple tools to use, and it's a tool called Floss. And so Floss is an improvement on another tool that's called strings.exe, so strings, Floss, it's kind of the similar idea. And so what strings and Floss do is that you can point them at a binary and they will try to extract as many of the text strings as possible that are inside of that binary. And it can either print them out to the screen or it can print them out to a file. And so what I'm going to do is run Floss here, and it just might take a second. And Floss is going to pull the strings, and it's also going to attempt to decode and organize them once they are all uh, done being pulled out. So we might get some errors here. That's fine. It might take a second, so I'm going to cut over to when it's done. All right, now it looks like that finished up, so let's open up the output of Floss. And so what we're left with here is just a bunch of ASCII text strings. And honestly, a lot of these are going to be kind of garbled junk. We do get a couple of API calls in here, which we can look at to see if we can figure out what the binary might be doing. But this is all going to be very high level. And we might not be able to discern a whole lot out of the output of this. But there is something interesting that Floss does. All the way at the bottom here, it's actually going to try to organize a little bit of this data. And that's why Floss is a bit of an improvement over strings. It will try to decode. Uh, any strings that it finds, and it will try to extract any of the stack strings, strings that are used um, during the execution of the program. And so we don't get any decoded strings, but we do get this right here, and it looks like this weird kind of URL, right? HTTP, it calls out to this very strange URL right here. Now, if you didn't know anything else about the binary at this point, um, you might be able to make an educated guess that this is some kind of command and control server. Certainly that's very common in uh, executables and, and uh, malware. This isn't the case here. And we're going to go over that when we get to the more advanced uh, phases of this analysis. But just for now, know that Floss can be used to pull out all of these text strings. A lot of them are going to be kind of nonsense. 
Um, but if there are any kind of interesting callouts like that, Floss might be able to get you some of the more interesting data. So that's our first tool of Floss. So let's take a look at this tool called UniExtract. UniExtract is right here. It's going to be in your utilities section in your Flare VM tool uh, directory. And what you're going to do is point this at a binary and see if it can pull out any of the kind of like packed away, uh, maybe DLLs or executables that are inside of this, right? So we're going to give this WannaCry and we're going to just let this run. And it looks like here that it now is asking for a password. Um, I don't necessarily have the password right now. Uh, if we haven't gone any further than this, we probably don't know it. Um, so there's really nothing we can do about that. And it said, uh, okay, so we couldn't really uh, extract because we had that password and we didn't really give it anything, but we could still take a look at what it tried to extract. If we go to WannaCry Unpacked here, uh, this is in spite of the fact that we couldn't give it the password to do the extraction, it actually still got some stuff in here, right? And so what we have are taskse.exe and taskdl.exe. So it looks like these are actual packed executables that were inside and they don't have any, any uh, data in them, but they were able to be pulled out from the binary, right? So it looks like the, the initial WannaCry binary, so this guy right here, has actually some uh, extra resources on the inside that aren't available until you click on this, right? So good, good information to have. And if you go into the messages section, you're actually going to see all of those language packs that we have with the WNRY file extension. Interesting stuff, right? So again, we don't quite necessarily know what this is doing, but we saw that in strings and it looks like we saw these two executable titles in strings as well. And we have now unpacked those into our WannaCry unpacked folder with uni extract. All right, now the final part that we're going to do in our basic static analysis is going to be with a tool called PEView. And PEView is going to take the binary and look at the headers and the data information of the binary itself. And so you're going to go into Flare. We'll go down to Utils. There are actually a couple different ones to do this, um, but I'll stick with PEView. There we go. When you open up PEView, it's going to ask, hey, what do you, what do you want to analyze here? Let's point it right at, and it's not an executable yet. It's a, it's a base file. I haven't uh, added the exe uh, deliberately because I don't want to detonate it by accident. But if you go to this just base file here and load this in, what we're going to end up with is the byte string raw data of this executable that's loaded into PE view. And now portable executables have kind of a template of how they are assembled, right? And so when you load it into PE view, PE view is going to analyze this binary and say, oh, I know exactly where the headers are, where the data is, where the text data is. And so you can go through this, uh, each of these sections and, and gather some results about what is loaded in each of those sections inside of the binary. Interesting thing right here, the import table, you're going to see the imported uh, Windows API functions, right? So this could maybe give you a little bit of insight, not too much, but a little bit of insight into what the binary could probably do. Right off the bat, we see open uh, internet open A, internet open URL internet close handle. I would say this right here is a pretty good indication that this binary is going to reach out to the internet. That is also supported by the fact that we found that URL in the floss output. So we're starting to see maybe a little bit of the, um, of the function unravel as we look through this. Another data point of interest here are going to be the size of the raw data and the virtual sizes in each of these section headers for each of the data uh, header blocks, right? And so if you examine the size of the raw data compared to the virtual size, these are hex values. If you compare these two values, if the virtual size is significantly higher than the size of the raw data, you might be able to surmise at that point that the binary is doing something extra in its initialized form. So in other words, the size of the raw data is just when the binary is sitting there uh, at rest, not doing anything. And the virtual size is the size of the binary when all of the variables and all of the data inside is initialized. Now, the reason that there might be a delta between these two is because at runtime, the virtual size might grow because there is more functionality being unpacked from this binary. And so if the size of the raw data and the virtual size have a significant delta between them, specifically if the virtual size is higher than the size of the raw data um, by, you know, a, a good margin, uh, there's a good chance that this is a packed binary and that it's unpacking things as it is initializing. This is our basic static analysis breakdown so far. Uh, we have run strings and floss against the binary. And the output of that, we found the text strings for some embedded e executables that were part of the initial uh, binary file. 
we have some language packs and we have this weird URL, right? Uh, that was pulled out with floss. We then went to uni extractor. We found task se.exe, task dl.exe. Those were both extracted. It did require a password, which we didn't have. And if we look back at our file system here, we did actually end up extracting those, but we didn't get any data of them. So if I ran this right now, nothing would happen because there's no actual data inside of this binary, but it still gave us kind of like the shell of it and we got the, the name out of it. So that's interesting. And we could surmise at this point that we weren't able to actually get the data of these EXEs because we didn't have that password. Maybe we'll get that password at some point in the future. Right now, we're not sure. Um, we also extracted the language packs in that same uh, uni extractor uh, by using uni extractor. We use PE view. We looked at the API imports and the API calls. They look to be internet related. Uh, there's also some file system manipulation. Makes sense if your ransomware is going to be um, encrypting your files, it's gonna need to touch those files, move them around. And then we noticed that in the header information, the size of the raw data and the size of the virtual data look pretty much, it's pretty similar on each of those uh, header sections except for data, right? And so this means that the data section probably has some packed capabilities that we're not quite seeing yet. Well, we have done our basic static analysis and now it's time to get dangerous. So we're going to be doing our basic dynamic analysis and this means we're gonna be detonating the binary on our machine, but don't worry. Remember, we have set up our system so that it will not damage the underlying host when we do this. And furthermore, the other thing that you're going to want to do is have a reliable snapshot to revert back to. If you're on VM Workstation Pro, you can do this just right up here with the snapshot tool. If you're on the VM Workstation uh, non-pro version, you can just shut everything down, take like grab the entire directory of that virtual machine and just copy it as a backup, right? And then you can just revert to that anytime you need to. And so I've already done that. Uh, you know, what? just for good measure, I think I'm going to do that one more time. Take another snapshot, you know, measure twice, cut once kind of thing. And just one more time for good measure, ping 8.8.8.8 and transmit fail and ping 10.0.0.1. Remember, this is my home router. So if it hit that, I would still be routable to my home uh, host as well. And it looks like I'm good. I'm good to detonate this. I have a reliable backup. So let's go ahead. Let's arm this thing. Remember that this is the actual binary, but it's not an EXE yet. If we change it to EXE, if I run this, it's now going to detonate this binary. And so we will run as administrator and we'll see what happens. Oh boy, here we go. Oh, and we've already got some, some indicators right here, right? We have this wanted dot at dot EXE. And we have, it looks like every file that was on my desktop is now concatenated with a dot wncry extension and it looks like i won't be able to even open these up remember this was like a a text editor or a, this is a text file this is just the floss out right so oh no looks like wanna cry and we've got just this garbled junk right okay so this is definitely a ransomware attack when you uh when you detonate this there's also some extra stuff that we're going to wait for uh just because it's it's real cool when you when it actually shows up so we'll give it a second Oh, and there we go. Ooh, your files have been encrypted. What happened to my computer? Your important files are encrypted. Oh, no. So this is our, our classic little ransomware program. And that's actually this wannadecryptor.exe right here is when you double click on this, you can run this program, right? And this has the Bitcoin address and it has the, uh, the way to decrypt some of your files and check the payment. And there we go. There's our signature background that's been uh, changed to our super scary red text on the black background. And uh, yeah, you have, if you see this, you've been hit by ransomware. Congratulations. All right. So that, that's our first detonation for our, our basic dynamic analysis, right? We're going to take note of what we see here. So we will take screenshots of this. We'll take notes of what we see. We see that our text files are now completely encrypted. They're, they're not human readable. And if you had any kind of like other um, uh, pictures or anything like that, they would be encrypted as well. And so this is also going to limit our tool functionality on Flare VM because it, it, it's a good chance that the configuration files of any of these tools have also been encrypted because this recursively encrypts everything on your hard drive. So we won't be able to do any more analysis unless we revert back to our first snapshot. And that's what I'm going to do right now. And now we're going to start to use some tools to actually zero in on what it's doing. We've seen that it changes the background. We've seen that it encrypts the files, but what, what other kind of artifacts can we get out of this? And we're going to look at some network artifacts and some uh, host based artifacts. When we're talking about 
basic dynamic analysis artifacts, one of the first and most important things that we need to determine is, is this binary calling out to any internet facing resources, right? So the network signatures of this binary. A really good tool to find that out if it's doing that is FakeNetNG. When you start up FakeNetNG, it's going to start, and you can allow access, that's totally fine. This is essentially going to start a service that's going to mimic the internet, right? So we have our host and it's running, FakeNetNG is running on our local host right now. And it's essentially routing any net outbound network traffic is going to hit FakeNetNG first. And FakeNetNG is going to act like that internet resource, right? And so this is a really good way for us to get our uh, network based signatures. So let's go ahead and arm our binary and run it again. And something very interesting happens first. The, the very, very first thing that happens when you run this binary is that it sends, and you can see it right here, this DNS request to www.inpronounceable.com. But the interesting thing is that that is a string that we pulled out when we use strings and floss on the binary in the first place, right? So it's notable that the very first thing that this binary does before it does anything else is try to access this weird URL that it was calling out to. Um, and then whatever else after that happens, we have this as kind of the first thing that the binary does. All right, so we have a fresh installation. We have just detonated. Fake NG is up and running, and we're actually going to look at another set of network artifacts that come out of this. And it, it actually isn't coming off of the initial binary, which is this right here. It's not coming off of WannaCry, but it is coming off of this Wanna Decryptor executable that's unpacked as soon as you actually run this first binary. And this is the actual window, the program that says you have been encrypted and you need to pay us Bitcoin. This is the program that's launching when that window comes up, right? And so in that window, you, you have the options to decrypt some of your files, and then you can see that the decryption mechanism actually works and that you can pay Bitcoin to get the rest of them. Um, but there's also another kind of interesting thing here, and it goes so fast that you have to kind of keep up with FakeNet NG as these kind of ICMP uh, uh, beacons are coming across. But if you see right there that wanna decryptor right about in the middle of the page right now, uh, requesting on port 9050 to what is localhost, but what could be actually some kind of like Bitcoin server, right? So that happens when you hit this check payment button here. And so what we're going to do, we're going to hit that check payment button and see if that generates the same artifacts. And it does right here. It's actually just a little bit further up, but it goes so fast. So if you see right about there, I'll start it right on the first one. Everything contained in here is what's happening when you actually hit that check payment button. And these are all the network signatures. Now, we don't have the IP address of where it goes out to, but we do have the port number. And that's very interesting. Uh, perhaps a little bit more... Um, you know, disassembly of, of this binary uh, is going to show us where these uh, callouts are going to, right? But we know now that this task hsvc.exe is now, when we hit that check payment button, calling out to some IP address, which we don't have yet, but we do have the ports, right? So definitely something to know, and we'll put that in our notes and do further analysis. Very interesting so far. How about we take a look at the actual network traffic that's happening when we detonate the binary, right? Wireshark, no better tool to look at the network traffic. We'll put this onto our uh, Ethernet Zero interface. And of course, right now, very quiet. There's not a whole lot going on, but let's arm again, EXE, and we're going to run this one more time. And as soon as we do this, we're going to notice something very interesting. A flood of ARP requests are going to go out for all manner of addresses all around the subnets, right? So why would, as soon as it's detonated, why would there be this gigantic flood of ARP going out over what would have been, that you could replace this with, you know, 10.0.0.1, uh, 10.0.0.2. Well, the idea is that this is actually, this is a crypto uh, worm, and the, the idea is that this is now polling every other possible IP on a whole set of networks, and it looks like it's even going into, because we're getting the second octet is is varying here. So it's trying to find anything else on, by the looks of it, a slash 16 subnet and say, is there anybody else alive on this network that I can translate or transmit rather this uh, payload to? So one of the more interesting tools just from a tool functionality perspective is this one right here called RegShot. And this is located in the Flare Utilities section. And RegShot is very interesting because it will take a delta between two different states of your system and look at the registry keys and the files that are added, deleted, moved, folders that are added, deleted, uh, or removed, or, and so on and so forth. So 
the interesting thing is that you can take a first snapshot of your system as it is before you actually run the binary. And then once that's done, you can run the binary, detonate it, it lets you know all of its functionalities wreak havoc on your system, and then you can take a second shot and, and quickly, hopefully, realize and, and analyze what the binary is changing on your system. So we're going to let this run. This takes a bit because it's querying your entire registry, so it's just going to take a second, so we'll cut over to that. All right, great. In this instance, it has taken a snapshot of just my registry values. I did not tell it to look at any directories, but you could easily set that to the C directory and it will uh, look at everything under there. All right, fantastic. So as always, we're going to arm our binary.exe and we're going to run one more time. And we want to let the binary run its course all the way through, right? So we get some initial uh, output from this, but we want to actually have it make all of the registry changes and do everything that it's doing. So we're going to give that a second here. All right, so of course we have our scary spooky program here and we have the background and the red text. I think it's probably good now to do a second shot. And now this is going to analyze all of the registry keys on the system in their state after the binary has been detonated. And once this finishes, we can actually see a very clear delta between the first state and the second state. So we'll just let that run for a second. Great. And we have our keys and values have been set. And the next thing you have to do here is compare and output. And that's going to crunch the first shot and the second shot together and see if there's a delta between the two and read out the output in a either a text file. You can do an HTML as well. And so here's our text file. All right, so we found something very interesting here. So in going through this, because I, I remember that that task S-C-H-E dot E-X-E has, has some kind of unpacked capability here. So it looks like there was a command dot E-X-E so a command shell was run to maybe do something to this program data and then this like just weird whatever here and then task e.exe right here, right? And so what uh, WannaCry actually ends up doing is it will set this into a uh, registry key. So it sets this uh, task executable into its own registry key. And then it installs it into a, what ends up actually being a hidden directory here, right? So this, this directory name is, is kind of a bogus directory name, but it ends up being hidden inside of program data. And this is how it achieves persistence on the system. So when you run it, it creates this weird bogus uh, directory. It hides it, and then it creates a registry key value that means run this every single time uh, Windows starts up. So we found our persistence mechanism in here, and it's hidden away inside of the red shot uh, output. Very interesting stuff. All right, guys, so we have moved past our basic static and basic dynamic analysis, and we're moving into the real meat and potatoes of a malware reverse engineering job, which is going to be your advanced static and advanced dynamic analysis. It's very important to note here, this subject for the advanced parts of static and dynamic analysis is absolutely huge. It's very complicated, and I can't possibly do it justice in a time-limited video. But that having been said, I want to show you guys a couple of key functions when you view them under the lens of advanced static and advanced dynamic analysis, just to drive the point home of what this methodology looks like and what kinds of things it can uncover when you apply it. So let's jump right in. So first up is advanced dynamic analysis. It is dynamic, so we will be running the binary. Now... Before we even load it into the program that we're going to be running it in, if I right-click on this and click Run as Administrator, what, what is actually happening when I do that? Essentially, the operating system, the underlying operating system of this Windows machine is kind of just humming along, right? And if I decide to run this as Administrator or just run a program in general, the operating system is actually handing over control of execution to whatever is inside of this program. And this is a compiled program, but there are all kinds of instructions in here that are telling the operating system, hey, as soon as I start running, execute this instruction, execute this instruction, and so on and so forth. So what we're going to be doing in basic dynamic analysis is running the binary, but instead of letting the operating system handle the execution of those instructions, we're actually going to be running them inside of this. I know this looks scary, <laughs> but it's not too bad. This is called a debugger. And what you're seeing here is actually a breakdown of every single assembly instruction that is being run when the executable is is executed. But instead of letting the operating system just kind of run with it, we now have control over the flow of execution. If you see over here, this EIP extended instruction pointer 
is the thing pointing to the assembly instructions that you see in here that the operating system is going to execute next. And I can actually manipulate the flow of the execution of this program by hitting either F7 or F8. And you'll see here that if I want to let the program run a couple more instruction sets, I just hit F7, 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 F7. And then it's going to continue the execution until I decide to stop and I want to take a look at something. This is the exact same thing as running the executable here, but we actually have control over the flow. And we're looking at the assembly instructions inside of the binary. And we can get a ton of information out of doing this. All right, so we've loaded back into the program here and we're going to run it with the debugger. One of the first things that I like to do with a debugger is just put it right to the side and start at the very beginning of the program and just hold down F8. What F8 is going to do is every time you see one of these call functions right here, F8, instead of going into that call function and seeing every single instruction set that that call function is, is running, it's going to basically assume that everything inside of that call function has been run and just pass right over it instead of going down into the function and looking at all the instructions. And so this just kind of helps speed things along. It's still executing everything inside of that call function. And we don't, we don't right now we have no idea what these functions are doing, right? We're just running it and seeing what, if anything happens on the system and when that occurs. So the idea is that the program just exited right here, right? But all of these encrypted uh, files, the, the ransomware actually just encrypted all of my files and, and they appeared right there. That happened at some point while we were running through each of those functions. So the idea here, very briefly speaking, is to run the program with control of the execution flow, hit F8 a couple times, and then as soon as something happens, identify where that's happening in the program and you're gonna do what's called setting a breakpoint there. And I'll show you how to do that here in a second. Now, instead of kind of blindly firing and hoping that you hit something uh, to find a, a good breakpoint to set, one of the better places to look first is gonna be in your strings. And just like we, we pulled text strings out by using the static tools, uh, we can also do kind of the same thing in the debugger, but the difference here is that these strings are actually part of the execution flow. And so if you see anything interesting here, it might be worth putting a breakpoint there. What you're gonna do to set a breakpoint is hit F2. And so what I just did is that I found, you can see right over here, this is that weird URL again. And something is, is probably interesting about this weird URL. So I'm going to set a breakpoint there and we're actually going to examine what's happening when we go to that instruction set. All right, so we have our breakpoint here. We're going to go back over to the CPU. And what we're going to do, instead of hitting F7 or F8, we're actually going to hit F9. F9 will execute the program until either the, the program is waiting for input or if we hit it one more time, we're going to actually hit that breakpoint that we just set right here where this URL exists inside of the program. Now, when I saw this, I actually had an idea here. So this URL is going to be used somehow, and we don't quite know what that is. But instead of just using the debugger, let's actually use another tool, one that we've already used. We're going to fire up FakeNet NG again. Now, with the two programs side by side here, what I'm going to do is watch at, we've hit this breakpoint, and this URL, we don't necessarily know what's going to happen here, but we know that the URL is being used. And right when we hit this next call here in a second, this one right here, if we hit that the F8 one more time, what we're going to see over here in Fagnet is that that URL is called out to. We have identified the actual function, and we're going to set a breakpoint right there just so we don't forget it. We're going to hit the actual, we, we've just identified the actual function that calls out to that uh, weird URL. And so with further examination, we can actually do this in the debugger, but just to kind of bring it on home here, because we're so close to unraveling the mystery of what's going on here, we're actually going to move right over into the advanced static analysis and use Ghidra to identify how this is actually being handled. So let's move over there right now. All right, and we're going to bring it on home, advanced static analysis. Uh, we're going to load up Ghidra. We have no active projects, so we're going to start a new one, and we're going to call this Wanna Cry wanna cry all right very good the first thing that you have to do is is whatever uh executable that you're working in you have to actually just drop that right into Ghidra uh for it to kind of understand what it's working with and there we go it identifies that it's a portable executable in 32-bit architecture totally cool all set and it's going to try to do as much analysis as possible when we have it loaded in we're going to click this little dragon guy and we're going to launch into the code browser so this is going to be the entry function. This is the first function that is called inside of the program once the operating system hands control over. 
Uh, so on the in the kind of center off off center here, you have the actual assembly instructions here. And then on the right hand side here, you have Gidra's best attempt at decompiling what is in these assembly instructions into an actual piece of uh, high level code. Now it's not going to be one for one right into maybe the C++ that, that uh, this piece of malware was written in, but it's really, really close uh, most of the time. And so what you're going to do is just browse through and look at what's actually happening. And, and something interesting that you can do is you can actually rename functions and, uh, and function calls and variables. And so if we're in the entry function here and we see this exit and it's being uh, passed uh, local 6C, if we go up to, to local 6C equals, it's just this one right here, um, we actually see another function routine in here. So if the entry function is, is calling another function from there, we can actually probably ascertain that this is the main function, the function that all other calls are going to be made from. And so the cool thing here is that you can actually just rename this. You can rename variable if you want to. We'll call this main var. And you can rename the function if you want, and we'll call this main func. And so what you see is that uh, when the entry function exits, we're going to go right into main var. If you actually just double click on that and go right to the main function, it will drop you right into the decompiled code for the main function itself. Main func starts out, it lists a bunch of local variables. That's totally fine. And then it, gr it, it gives you this pu var 3 which is this weird URL string. And luckily, Gidra has identified that for us. So let's actually rename this, this variable into uh, weird URL. So weird URL, once we rename that, we can actually see wherever else it is called in this program. And you're going to go all the way down here. And what you're going to see is the same API calls opening a socket to the internet that we saw in the debugger. And so here we are at the crux of the first part of our, our advanced static analysis. And without going too far into what these two API calls are actually doing, very briefly speaking, Internet Open A and Internet Open URL A are going to open a socket to a particular URL. In this case, it is past this weird URL string that we've been seeing this whole time. And the success or failure of that connection is going to pass either a, either a Boolean value back to this variable right here. So it's either going to be zero in the case of a failure or one in the case of a success. And then this right here is the crux of the whole first part of this. If the result of IVAR2, IVAR2 being the uh, opening URL and checking that URL, if that is a zero, close the handle to that URL and then run everything that's inside of this function that I'm highlighting right here. Once everything inside of that function has been run and it returns back to this uh, to the main function, return zero and exit the program. And if the opposite is true, if there was a success when it was connecting to that URL, close the handle, but do nothing else. Return zero and exit the program and nothing else happens. So it begs the question, what is the difference between these two things? If there is no successful connection, run this function. And if there is a successful connection, do nothing, return zero and exit the program. This function happens to be the rest of the payload. This is the payload of every other thing that WannaCry can do to your machine. Open Service Manager, it installs the persistence, uh, it installs the taskchi.exe to run that wanted decryptor uh, scary window that pops up every single time. Um, the, this also it loads in the, the executable that will encrypt all of your files. So every other function is called from, from doing that. And so when MalwareTech found this, in the code and it's just one and two function calls inside. When he found this, he realized that uh, this URL, if, if, if WannaCry reached out and found this URL was functioning, nothing would happen. It would return zero, it would exit the program, and none of the uh, payload of WannaCry would actually be delivered. And so he, he registered this as an actual website, initially hoping to just capture how many connections that he could get but he realized that the infection stopped occurring because of this piece of code right here. Fascinating stuff. All right, and here we are. This is the roll-up of all four phases of analysis on WannaCry, and uh, I gotta do this real fast because I got a cat loose in my office and I'm about 30 seconds away from getting my keyboard trampled over. And so without any further ado, let's just review our notes and, and bring it on home. Uh, basic static analysis breakdown, we started with strings and floss. We looked at some of the strings that are coming out of the binary and identified a couple of uh, interesting pieces of text that could be key functionality. 
uh, we looked at some of the embedded resources that are extracted at runtime of the binary with uni extractor we also loaded it into pe view and we looked at some of the uh, imports and exported api calls we then moved on to basic dynamic analysis and we ran the binary under a couple of different uh, circumstances and looked at some of the artifacts that are coming out of that primarily we looked at red shot where we would take a uh, snapshot of the, f of the uh, computer before we ran the binary and after and looked at the delta of the registry between those two and we found the uh, key value that it sets to establish persistence uh, on the host. And then we looked at some of the network signatures by uh, firing up FakeNet, NG, and Wireshark and we looked at this weird URL call that's being sent out and we found some interesting API calls out to a certain URL. And then we cross-correlated that in advanced static analysis by loading it into Ghidra. And we found those same API calls. And we also found the weird URL is passed to a small block of code that will either execute all of the functions in the rest of the binary or exit, depending on if the URL has been hit or not. And so what we've done is we've determined a whole lot of information about the binary just from performing four of the uh, phases of analysis for this. And there's so much more to go on here and, and so many other functions that we could go into. We didn't even cover the encryption. We, we were really just scratching the surface here, but this should be a very good primer and give you guys an idea of where to go from here. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. My name, again, is Husky Hacks, and this is Husky versus WannaCry, a crash course in malware reverse engineering. Thank you for watching. And I will see you guys next time.